A paper that announced the rediscovery of the ivory-billed woodpecker in Arkansas in 2005 was the first report of this elusive bird by ornithologists in several decades. This exciting news motivated searches in other areas, and another group of ornithologists reported a series of sightings in Florida the following year. I decided to conduct a search in the Pearl River Swamp in Louisiana, where there had been recent reports of sightings. The proximity of my employer's office at the Stennis Space Center, which appears in the distance, made feasible the type of long-term effort that is required to have a reasonable chance of finding ivory-billed woodpeckers. During eight years of field work, I had nine sightings along English Bayou, which corresponds to the lighter colored trees that cross the center of the image from left to right. Video footage that was obtained during two of the encounters is discussed here. Each of these videos contains conclusive evidence for the persistence of the ivory-billed woodpecker in Louisiana. They have been analyzed and presented in a series of peer-reviewed journal articles that may be accessed at fishcrow.com. Nobody has identified any flaws in the analysis or provided plausible alternative explanations. Many ornithologists have asserted that the ivory-billed woodpecker is extinct, but none of them have dared to engage in open discourse on this evidence. During a five-day period in February 2006, I had a series of five sightings, twice heard the distinctive Kent calls of the ivory-billed woodpecker, and obtained the first video. Birds are painted onto photos in these artistic recreations of two of the sightings, which are representative of my views of the definitive field marks on the dorsal surfaces of the wings. During these sightings, I also observed remarkable flight characteristics that are consistent with the ivory-billed woodpecker. During the encounter illustrated here, I heard a long series of Kent calls coming from behind a fallen tree on the bank. I quietly maneuvered the kayak up to the bank as a robin was scolding from above. While I waited in position to obtain a photo with a still camera, Kent calls started coming from behind me on the opposite side of the bayou. After the second bird apparently saw me near the first bird, there were a few harsh scolding calls and then a long series of high pitch calls from the second bird. And the first bird stopped calling. Two days later, I came upon a perched ivory bill woodpecker at the same location. The same high-pitched calls started coming from the direction of the bird as it flushed into the woods. I tracked the movements of the calls through the woods. About 10 minutes after the bird flushed, I spotted motion deep in the woods at a distance of 128 meters and obtained video footage of an ivory-billed woodpecker that was perched and took two flights. Part of the perch tree was collected after it blew down. As indicated by the dashed lines, the tree specimen was cut to include forks that facilitated scaling of reference photos relative to frames from the video. A large baseline favors accurate scaling, and the distance between the forks is 1.41 meters. Critics of the rediscovery of the ivory-billed woodpecker are entrenched in the position that this species is extinct. There seems to be no limit to how low they will stoop in order to try to explain away evidence for persistence. One of their conspiracy theories is that the tree specimen was cut from a different tree in order to produce a misleading size comparison. As can be seen from these images, the tree specimen was indeed cut from the actual perch tree. If an ivory-billed woodpecker specimen is lost or damaged, it isn't practical to obtain a replacement. For this reason, I wasn't able to borrow an ivory-billed woodpecker specimen for a direct size comparison. However, I visited the Smithsonian and inspected these trays of female and male specimens. 
I used the largest male in the right tray in a comparison. I photographed that specimen next to a half meter stick. If the head were rotated to the right, the distance from the tip of the tail to the tip of the bill would be about 50 centimeters. This specimen is near the maximum size for the ivory-billed woodpecker, which is one of the most massive woodpeckers in the world. The smallest ivory-billed woodpecker is more massive than the largest pileated woodpecker. Jeff Hill let me borrow the pileated woodpecker specimen appearing in this size comparison from the Auburn University Museum. This specimen was mounted on the tree specimen along with a meter stick, which was used to scale the ivory bill woodpecker specimen as indicated by the red line segments. A dashed white curve was used to mark the outline of the body of the pileated woodpecker specimen. This curve was copied without changing its size and placed over the body of the woodpecker in the 2006 video which dwarfs the pileated woodpecker and is comparable in size to an ivory-billed woodpecker that is near the maximum size for that species. The woodpecker in the 2006 video is therefore larger than any pileated woodpecker. This figure is from one of Jeff Hill's papers. The pileated woodpecker is a common species for which plenty of data exist. Woodpeckers excavate cavities that are just large enough to enter. An excessively large entrance would provide easier access to a predator. The entrance to a woodpecker cavity may be round or oval shaped. As indicated by the red dashed line, the maximum diameter of the major axis is 12 centimeters for the pileated woodpecker. Note that there is no overlap in the dimensions of the openings to cavities of the two large woodpeckers. This is a reflection of the fact that the smallest ivory bill woodpecker is more massive than the largest pileated woodpecker. As indicated here, the meter stick was used to scale a dashed yellow box with a diameter of 12 centimeters which is the maximum dimension of the opening to a pileated woodpecker cavity. The scaling box was copied and placed over the body of the woodpecker in the video. There is plenty of clearance for the body of the pileated woodpecker specimen, which corresponds to the dashed curve. But the woodpecker in the video would get stuck if it were to try to enter the largest cavity of a pileated woodpecker. The woodpecker in the 2006 video was analyzed by Julie Zikafuz, an avian artist who specializes in the ivory bill woodpecker. One of her depictions of that species appeared on the cover of a leading ornithology journal, which was the current issue when the 2006 video was obtained. Avian artists study the nuances of their subjects in great detail much more so than most bird watchers and even ornithologists. According to Zikafuz, the woodpecker in the 2006 video, which is larger than any pileated woodpecker and too large to fit into any cavity of that species, has several characteristics and behaviors that are consistent with the ivory-billed woodpecker, but not the pileated woodpecker. This image shows the large bill, reared back posture, long and fluffy crest, and long neck that Zikafus mentioned. Many photos of pileated woodpeckers are readily available on the web, but there do not appear to be any with characteristics similar to the bird in the video. The large woodpeckers are superficially similar, but they belong to different genera and have substantial differences. The pileated woodpecker on the left has a relatively low mass and broad wings that are suited for a territorial species that frequently makes short flights. 
The ivory billed woodpecker is one of the most massive woodpeckers in the world, and it has narrow wings that are suited for long distance flights at high speed. The bird in the video takes a flight between limbs that is less than one meter. A pileated woodpecker takes such short flights nearly effortlessly. It is known from historical accounts that the ivory-billed woodpecker usually flaps its wings during short flights between limbs, and this is what would be expected for a massive species with narrow wings. Zikafus mentioned that the short flight in the video is unlike anything she has seen a pileated woodpecker do, and the short flight in the video is compared with short flights by pileated woodpeckers here. All of these flights play at half speed. The deep and rapid flap of the bird in the video does not seem to be consistent with the flaps of the pileated woodpeckers. During my work in the Pearl River, I frequently sat in a kayak within a few tens of meters of pileated woodpeckers that showed no concern for my presence. Arthur T. Wayne left an account of ivory-billed woodpeckers that were too wild to be approached nearer than 300 or 400 yards. The large woodpecker in the video was well beyond the range at which a pileated woodpecker would be alarmed, but well within the range at which an ivory-billed woodpecker would be alarmed. It never engaged in any of the typical behaviors of a non-alarm pileated woodpecker, such as drumming, calling, or foraging. It repeatedly showed signs of being alarmed by raising its crest and hiding behind the tree. It made unusual motions, such as rotating around the branch while remaining in a lean-back posture. This is the flight that Zikafus described as ponderous and heavy. This footage plays at half speed. All recordings of known and putative calls of the ivory-billed woodpecker consist of simultaneously excited harmonics. Appearing here are putative Kent calls that Jeff Hill and his colleagues recorded in Florida. The horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is frequency. Several equally spaced frequencies are excited simultaneously for each of the three calls. The Kent calls that were captured in the 1935 recording have a similar structure. The high-pitched calls were twice heard coming from the direction of an alarmed ivory-billed woodpecker. On both occasions, the calls began at the moment the bird became alarmed. They fit Tanner's description of a high-pitched alarm call that was not captured in the 1935 recording. The fundamental frequency of 2.35 kHz is more than double the fundamental frequency of the putative Kent calls that Hill recorded. The high-pitched calls sound similar to the Blue Jay Bell call, but published examples of those calls don't consist of simultaneously excited harmonics. The calls of the wood thrush have a much more complex structure in which different frequencies are excited at different times. The continuous stream of video that was obtained during the encounter documents that I had a sighting, tracked the movement of the high-pitched calls, and then back the kayak into an observation position before obtaining footage of the bird. At this point, I have just turned on the camera after the sighting, and I'm struggling to hold the camera while turning the kayak. Several of the high-pitched calls are audible in the first few minutes of the video. I track the movement of the high-pitched calls while drifting back down the bayou in the direction the bird had flown into the woods.
After the high-pitched calls seemed to stop, I backed the kayak into an observation position near the opposite bank.
At this point, the camera is aimed in the direction of calls that I heard after arriving at the observation position. The camera was aimed in the direction of the tree where the bird was perched when I detected motion and zoomed the camera. After detecting motion in the perch tree, I kept the camera aimed in that direction with my right hand while trying to spot the bird through binoculars with my left hand. I also looked through the viewfinder and adjusted the zoom. Despite failing to spot the bird, I obtained video footage while it was perched and taking flights. Parts of the video are replayed here at half speed. The 2006 video was obtained during a flurry of encounters that is unique among all reports in recent decades. I'm not aware of anyone else who had five sightings in five days with excellent views of definitive field marks. I also heard Kent calls on two occasions, once coming from two directions at the same time. This series of encounters cannot be dismissed as a series of mistakes and they are supported by video evidence. The video documents that I turned the kayak immediately after a sighting, tracked the high-pitched calls that are audible in the video, and backed the kayak into an observation position. After this series of events, I obtained footage of the bird. There are forks in the perch tree that facilitated scaling reference images. The large woodpecker in the video is comparable in size to an ivory-billed woodpecker specimen that is near the maximum size for that species. The body is too wide to fit into the largest pileated woodpecker cavity. It is larger than any pileated woodpecker. According to an avian artist who specializes in the ivory-billed woodpecker, the large woodpecker in the video has several behaviors and characteristics 
that are consistent with the ivory-billed woodpecker, but not the pileated woodpecker, including the crest, bill, neck, lean-back posture, and short flight between limbs. While perched well beyond the distance at which a pileated woodpecker would be alarmed, the large woodpecker in the video showed signs of being alarmed, but never engaged in any of the typical behaviors of a non-alarmed pileated woodpecker. In more than 30 minutes of footage, there are no calls or drumming of a pileated woodpecker. It's extremely challenging to find a wary bird in a southern swamp forest. This footage was obtained in the Pearl River in late February just before the leaves start to come out. This is the most favorable time of year for visibility in the forest, but it's still not very good. The ivory-billed woodpecker is known from historical accounts to fly long distances over the treetops. During my second year of field work, I got the idea to use some of the tallest trees in the swamp as observation platforms. I selected trees such as these that provide views out to long ranges. In this case, a pileated woodpecker is flying over the treetops in the distance. Here's the same bird with a camera on full zoom. Since the ivory-billed woodpecker is a large bird with prominent field marks, I was hoping that I would be able to identify one, of, one from several hundred meters away and perhaps discover the location of a nest or roost. The approach ended up working, but not in the way I expected. On March 29, 2008, I was keeping watch out over the treetops from a tree that was selected up the same bayou where I had several sightings and obtained a video in 2006. An ivory-billed woodpecker actually flew along the bayou almost directly below. This footage is shown at half speed. Here the bird is approaching from down the bayou. Since the bird and its reflection are both visible, it was possible to pin down locations of the bird along its path and estimate size and flight speed. Note that the wings are folded closed and paused briefly in the middle of each upstroke. Here the wings are open and closed. Open and closed. Among the large birds, most species keep their wings open throughout the entire flap cycle. The large woodpeckers are the only exception. As indicated by this comment in Tobolsky's paper, most large birds are incapable of flap bounding flight, in which the wings are folded closed during the middle of each upstroke. This type of wing motion is illustrated here for a pileated woodpecker. The pileated woodpecker and the ivory-billed woodpecker are the only large birds of the region that have this type of wing motion in cruising flight. All of the other large birds keep their wings extended throughout the entire flap cycle. For example, this is a great blue heron. These are black-bellied whistling ducks. And these are white ibises. At this point, the wings are extended and then swept back. Extended and then swept back. In this historical photo, the wings are in a similar swept back position. 
When I initially spotted the bird flying up the bayou in the distance, I thought it was a wood duck on the basis of its large size and high flight speed. There are historical accounts of ivory-billed woodpeckers being mistaken for ducks. But when the bird passed nearly directly below, 75 feet below, I saw the dorsal stripes on the back, which are a diagnostic field mark of the ivory-billed woodpecker that appear in this historical photo. Then, as it continued up the bayou, I saw the black leading edges and white trailing edges on the dorsal surfaces of the wings. At this point, the reflection of the bird from the water shows wings with a high aspect ratio long and narrow wings that are consistent with an ivory-billed woodpecker but not a pileated woodpecker. At this point, the white patches on the wings and some of the black on the wings are visible. The black doesn't show as well as the white because the mud along the bayou is very dark as can be seen in this image. At this point, the white patches on the wings are clearly visible and they extend from the bases of the wings to near the tips of the wings. There's also a trace of white up the back and the neck that is consistent with dorsal stripes. There is no question that we are looking at the dorsal surface of the bird, which shows evidence of field marks that are diagnostic of the ivory-billed woodpecker and are not consistent with the pileated woodpecker. The white patches persist as the bird continues up the bayou. In the reflection from the bayou here, the characteristic wing motion of a large woodpecker is visible once again. Here the wings are extended and folded closed. Let's watch the video again at half speed. The bird and its reflection are visible. The wings are folded closed. There are prominent white patches on the dorsal surfaces of the wings. Since the bird was initially flying nearly directly toward the camera, the vertical and horizontal components of wingtip motion are visible in the Fly Under video. Tobolsky used this type of data to study the flight mechanics of woodpeckers in his 1996 paper. In analyzing the Fly Under video, Tobolsky extracted the wingtip curves that appear in the top half of this figure along with curves that he previously published for the pileated woodpecker. Tobolsky obtained these curves with a frame-by-frame -frame analysis of this part of the video. At this point, the span has a minimum and the elevation has a plateau as the wings are briefly paused. Similar features appear in the curves that Tobolsky extracted from the Fly Under video. On the basis of the flat bounding flight and wingtip curves, Tobolsky concluded that the bird in the Fly Under video is a large woodpecker and provided these comments. 
The flap rate is about 10 standard deviations above the mean flap rate of the pileated woodpecker. Historical accounts suggest that the flap rate of the ivory-billed woodpecker is significantly higher than the flap rate of the pileated woodpecker. Tobolsky concluded that the bird in the video is a large woodpecker on the basis of a flight mechanics analysis that does not require knowledge of the wingspan. The conclusion that the bird in the video is a large woodpecker may be arrived at with a more direct approach that involves estimating the wingspan. In this image, Tommy Tuma of the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries is holding a 24-inch reference object that was cut from a yardstick. This reference object is longer than the wingspan of the belted kingfisher, which is the third largest species of the region besides the two large woodpeckers that folds its wings closed in the middle of the upstroke. As can be seen in one of the inset photos, the belted kingfisher has prominent black and white field marks near the tips of the wings. There is no trace of those field marks in the video. There are two records of the ringed kingfisher in Louisiana. That larger kingfisher has similar field marks on the wings. This photo shows the same scene with the camera zoomed out. Since the bird and its reflection from the surface of the bayou both appear in the video, it was possible to determine locations of the bird along its flight path. In these images from the video, there are circles around the direct and reflected images. As marked by the arrows, the projection of the horizontal position of the bird onto the surface of the bayou corresponds approximately to the midpoint between the direct and reflected images. The lines between the images are vertical, but the camera was not held perfectly level. Various trees that appear in the video were used to scale images from the video. Small tree branches were removed to obtain the reference photo above. The width of the white rectangle matches the length of the reference object. The rectangle was cut and pasted onto the image from the video without changing its size. In this part of the video, the wings are well resolved when partially extended. The wings fit within the rectangle when partially extended, but it appears that they would not fit within the rectangle when fully extended. In this part of the video, the wings are poorly resolved when fully extended. After adjusting the contrast and brightness in the lower image, however, it is clear that the wingspan is well over 24 inches and consistent with the wingspan of a large woodpecker. The two large woodpeckers are the only birds of the region that have a wingspan over 24 inches and fold their wings closed in the middle of the upstroke in cruising flight. This argument is based on the fact that the wings are folded closed. Tobolsky's argument is based on a more detailed analysis of the wing motion. It is important to have two ways of demonstrating that the bird in the video is a large woodpecker. After arriving at that conclusion, it then follows from the flap rate that the ivory-billed woodpecker is the only possibility. The flight speed was estimated by using objects that appear in the video to determine positions of the bird along its flight path. Stakes were placed at the midpoints between the direct and reflected images to obtain approximate horizontal positions along the surface of the bayou. Various tree branches were lined up to place this stake nearly directly below. This tree, this log, and this reflection of a tree were used to determine the position of this stake, which corresponds to a point 4.38 seconds earlier. These stakes correspond to the minimum and maximum flight speeds that Tobolsky published for the pileated woodpecker. 
The bird in the 2008 video had a flight speed of 15.2 meters per second, which is well above the range of 7.5 to 11.6 meters per second that Tobolsky published for the pileated woodpecker. When the wings of an ivory-billed woodpecker are extended, the dorsal surfaces have black leading edges and white trailing edges. When the wings are folded closed, the white trailing edges form a white triangular patch on the back. In intermediate positions, the wings may have a swept back appearance. White trailing edges are prominent in several frames of the video. Let's increase the color and the contrast in order to enhance the black leading edges against the dark brown mud along the bayou. Evidence of both the white trailing edges and the black leading edges is visible in several frames. Let's increase the brightness slightly to help distinguish the black body from the brown mud. The black leading edges are visible. Now the wings are going into a swept back position. The black leading edge is still visible. Let's decrease the brightness slightly to enhance the black leading edge. In the reflection from the water here, it is easy to see when the wings are folded closed. When this happens, there is a white feature that appears to be consistent with the white triangular patch. The 2008 video wasn't obtained in a vacuum. It was the last day of my third season of field work in the Pearl River, and I already had eight other sightings along the same bayou. The video was obtained from 75 feet up in Tree 6, an observation platform that was selected by Steve Sillett, a distinguished tree climbing biologist who came to the Pearl River in 2007 to get me started with the tree climbing approach. In this footage, Jim Spickler and Steve are rigging Tree 6. The 2008 video was obtained a short distance up the bayou from where the 2006 video was obtained. The video documents that I was keeping watch out over the treetops, I followed the flight of the bird for about 10 seconds, and I was in an ideal position from close range and directly above to observe the definitive dorsal field marks. There is no question that the wings are folded closed in the middle of the upstroke. The appearance of the bird and its reflection in the video made it possible to pin down positions along the flight path and determine the wingspan and flight speed. The combination of the wingspan and the wing motion are consistent with the two large woodpeckers, but no other species of the region. An expert on woodpecker flight mechanics used an alternative approach to conclude that it's a large woodpecker. After concluding that it's a large woodpecker, the conclusion that it must be an ivory-billed woodpecker follows from the flap rate, which is about 10 standard deviations greater than the mean flap rate of the pileated woodpecker. The high flight speed, narrow wings, swept back wings and white trailing edges on the dorsal surfaces of the wings are also consistent with the ivory-billed woodpecker but not the pileated woodpecker.